Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale radio controlled ArmorTech King Tiger heavy tank. Since the last video update, the model is 99.999% complete with the exception of one or two small little things that still need to be done. But outside of that, this one here is about ready to get its done stamp. So in this video, we're going to be going over the final fittings that were added to this model, bringing up to the condition that we have here. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. Picking up where we left off from the last video, the camo and the weathering work are done. So that means it's now time to get the engine deck fixed permanently in place. As I mentioned in an earlier video, the engine deck is designed to be secured to the model via silicone, which gives it a temporary but firm bond. For whatever reason, if there's an emergency you need to get access to this portion of the model, you just rip the unit right out and it will cause minimum amounts of damage. So right now, I'm going through the process of removing all of the mask work that I spawned in an earlier video. Obviously, it'd be really anticlimactic to go through all of this engine compartment detailing, only to have it all get oversprayed with the paint. So with that all removed, I can go ahead and start applying the silicone. Really don't need a whole lot, just a few dabs here or there. That's all that's going to be necessary just to keep everything where it needs to be. That's basically it. Engine deck will find its sweet spot and then we'll just lock on where it needs to go, like so. Obviously when you're using stuff like silicone, you want to make sure that you don't have any on your fingers or anywhere else because once the stuff gets on a surface it has a pretty bad habit on smudging pretty easily. Okay, so the main engine deck is now on. I'm now going to add the glue to the little end pieces that we have right here. Just a little dab. Just like that will do it. And then these just get dropped directly into place with no fuss and no muss. Okay, and well, well man, might as well peel off the last of tape on here. With the mask removed, you can see that the mask did a fantastic job with preventing any sort of overspray and protecting the inner confines here of the engine hatch, the engine hatch rim, and most importantly, the engine compartment itself. The engine compartment looks just as good as it did before the model headed off into paint. So, with that out of the way, we can continue with the remainder of the final portion of this build. So, with the project really roller coastering to an end, this is probably some of the last bits of detailing that still remain to be assembled. What we have here are the model's cleaning stage, and these are still left in the original packaging, and I might as well go ahead and show what they look like when you get one of these Armor Tech kits. So in the bag here, we have some other parts that are not going to be used. So let's go ahead and take, take peel it off of the bag. Going straight into recycling. All right, so this over here are the the mesh work, those screen covers that go on the rear section of the King Tiger. Obviously, I already discussed these in another earlier video, and these ones here are not going to be used because I tooled up brand new ones that are 3D printed and all that good stuff. Recommend checking out that video, or even just staying tuned to this video to see towards the end because I actually fit them onto the model. So, this now leads us to the staves. The staves are obviously a very crucial bit of detailing found on the sides of these German tanks. Same is true for the Tiger. Panther has them concealed in that tube, and, and you can also see it on the Panzer IVs. Regardless, on the Armortech King Tiger here, these are the components that we have, and this is basically true to form to what is seen on other Armortech kits, be it Tiger ones or the King Tiger. In the past, they have differed slightly, and I'll go over that in a second, but basically you get the same similar type of appearance, and 
for what it's worth, the Armor Tech pieces are actually really good, and I'm going to simply use them out of box with hardly any sorts of really changes being made. So, the majority of the staves themselves are supplied via these wooden dowel rods, which is awesome because the rods on the real vehicle were made out of wood, wood pole specifically, so this is perfect. They come pre-sized, as you see, and are actually ready for assembly out of the bag, which is excellent. So, needless to say, these are going to be utilized. The next thing are the fittings. Now the fittings are CNC'd out of metal. And you can see they have the male and female ends right here and here. And this is something that's a little bit different compared to some of the earlier releases of these kits that I've seen in the past. On, for instance, my Armor Tech King Tiger, the staves were actually made from CNC brass and they swapped that out in recent years for aluminum. The quality is identical, it's just a material switch. The only reason why this is relevant is because on the real German tanks, these were actually made from brass. So if you have one of the earlier ones, basically you're already ahead of the game. And there's really not that much more to do to the staves outside of giving them some surface weathering. On these ones here, obviously these are definitely going to be utilized, but they are going to be painted. And you'll see how I achieve that momentarily. With my little box cutter over here, I'll go ahead and open the bag. So here you get to see what the stave and connectors look like. Note they have their threads in place, which is awesome. And they are nice and machined through and through. There's a little burr on the inside of that one, but you know, that's normal. And you can see that it's sized to fit onto the wooden rods. It is a tight fit, so some small hand fitting is going to be required on the builder's part in order to remove just the right amount of material for the pieces to fit in place. But you know, this is quite customary on these type of fittings. The next is the... The opposite end and you can see the piece is still drilled out through and through this portion here would be threaded on the real one so you could go ahead and screw these together however on this model here they are not uh, if you want to if you really want to go the next further step you can hit this with a tap and die where you could cut the threads in place and then you can actually thread these together however for the purposes of this build that's not going to be necessary because frankly put these pieces are just going to be affixed to the side of the model and once fastened in place they're not ever going to be removed so the adding of the threads isn't necessary for this particular build but it's just something i want to put across in case anyone out there is working on one of these and they want to go ahead and do a little bit of extra uh, machining to it yeah with just a simple tap and die you can go ahead and cut these threads and you can have the piece actually thread together, but for this build here, that's not really going to be relevant. The next bit of equipment to mention are the model's toe shackles. The toe shackles you see here are not supplied with the stock Armor Tech kit. Instead, these ones are an aftermarket accessory from the company Six Scale Icons. These components here, just like with the tools I mentioned in an earlier video, are more or less an antique in their own right because Six Scale Icons was a company that made very excellent metal German 1-6 scale detail aftermarket components for tank models. However, the owner passed away about a decade or so ago, and since then the rights have been sold off to another company. I'm not sure if the company still produces the components that you see here, but these ones here are original OG Six Scale Icons parts. And just like with the Highlander, the supplies of these are really starting to dwindle, and at one point there will be only one. So until then though, here we have the components on the desk now, because it's actually a really good opportunity to get them on camera. So the toe shackles are all made, and the components I should say, are all made out of cast white metal alloy. These are not steel, you cannot actually tow the vehicle with these components. They are primarily for detail purposes only, and if you try to tow the model with it, well, you know, it's not going to work out too well. Regardless, the U-shackles are right here. They have the appropriate shape for the components. And these were actually offered in two types of patterns. You had the round bar pattern, and you also had the flat bar pattern. Obviously, this one here is the former. They are drilled out through and through. And, you know, basically what you see is what you get. The set also contains the locking pins. And the pins are, again, true to form to the real one. They just go directly in place. And there is a small little hole that's pre-drilled into the end here, and that's for the use of a cotter pin. The cotter pin is not supplied, or is there any wire supplied, or at least with the example that I have here. So this is something that's going to have to be formed by myself, but obviously a few minutes with a plier and some floor wire will, you know, give me that bit of detailing. However, the parts are basically ready to go out of the box. There is just a small amount of 
casting flash to address with some sandpaper and once that's addressed the pieces will be ready for primer and painting. So while I was going through the motions of the build, one thing that caught my eye was with this area over here. You see on the lower sections of this model, there are these fasteners that are found on these areas. And if we can recall to one of the early videos of when this project was first started, I actually went ahead and made some modifications to the lower section over here involving the number of fasteners that are found on that area. As a quick recap, with the way the King Tiger is, and the same is also true for the Tiger 1 and the Panther, there are fasteners found in these areas which are for mounting onto the final drives. These fittings are found on the Armor Tech kit, however the number needs to have been revised in order to improve the accuracy. I go through great lengths on exactly how this was done, however one thing that I forgot to do was to actually add the fastener heads themselves. Fortunately these details are just that, they're details and are dummies only, so they're going to be installed at this time. The fasteners themselves are nothing more than Allen cap screws, which are painted and are just going to be secured to these locations and once mounted are going to complete the lower area here. Obviously, it's going to be a mirror image on the reverse side of the model. That's more like it. <laughs> once the fasteners are added in place, you can see how it completes the look of the final drive area on both sides of the model's lower hull. Obviously, something else that needs to be affixed to the rear at this time are the grenade grills. These were touched upon in the earlier video, but now you can actually see them fully painted, weathered, and also ready for installation. Nothing much to go on over here. It's the exact same painting and weathering that was applied to the fenders as well as to the tank itself, so everything's going to blend in with its continuity. That's all there really much is to that. With the rear engine deck now installed to the model, the next thing to focus on are the last of the surface detailing. Basically, the cake dressing is what we like to call it in the business. So here you can see a large number of the components that were mentioned earlier in the video, but now they have been fully painted and weathered. And at this point here, they are finally ready for installation. So starting with the staves, here you get to see what they look like fully completed. As I touched upon before, the units were assembled out of the box. There's really no modifications that are made. The only thing that I do want to mention is that in order to get the pieces to fit onto the piece here of dowel rod, you do need to remove a little bit of material on each end, just enough material so that the piece will slip on in place. With the way the tolerances are with these pieces, they are a bit on the snug side, which is, you know, really what you want. And in order to make them fit a little bit easier, what I do is I put them on the lathe and I just remove just a slight bit of material. Basically, it's almost negligible, the amount of material that was removed, but it's just enough for the piece to slide directly in place. Once the material is removed, the piece then gets glued to the two appropriate locations, thus completing the assembly. The other thing I want to mention is you want to make sure that you thoroughly mark the correct amount of material to remove. Obviously, if you remove too much, it's going to be a bit problematic. So you want to carefully line the pieces up and mark accordingly with a pencil. And then once the material is removed on the first one, basically you just try the piece and adjust accordingly. Once you have the depth lined up, then you could just rinse, wash, repeat for the remainder of the staves. As for the staves themselves, the end connectors, like I touched upon earlier on the kit ones, are made from aluminum. However, the real ones are made from brass. Well, in order to do this, I simply just spray painted the aluminum ones, the brass color that you see here. For my brass color, I like to use actually gold spray paint, specifically it's just a can of Walmart gold spray paint. It's just the, you know, the El Cheapo version as I like to always say. And that color, I don't know if it's still available, it's an old can that I have on hand, but it does a really good job with mimicking brass quite well. And I've also utilized this color on my submarine propellers and also I've utilized in the past on ammunition that you've seen on the various belts that are on a large number of my models. Regardless, once the pieces are thoroughly painted, I then go ahead and weather them with a wash, dulling them out a little bit and giving them just more of a used look. Keep in mind, this is used to swab the barrel, so you know, you're going to be getting some soot fouling on them with usage. As for the rods themselves, I went ahead and stained them along with the remainder of the wood with a brown a flat brown type color that I have on hand. It's not even stained, it's just a, a, a acrylic flat brown paint, but it does a real good job with 
uh, changing the wood material of the stock rods to the way that you see here. This material, I should say this paint, I've used on a few other builds in the past, and it, I always found it to yield for some excellent results. Basically, I just apply with a paintbrush, I smear off with a rag if necessary, and this is the end result. Same thing is also going to be true again for the other wood colors. The remainder of the weathering is done with the airbrush with both flat white as well as also a little bit of diluted black. And again, once you're done, the outcome looks pretty good for the components in hand. So in addition to the staves, the next bit of equipment is the jack block. This was something that I've touched upon in an earlier video when I went ahead and took the stock jack block, which is supplied with the kit. The wooden block that we have here is kit supplied. However, this was modified with the ECA jack block accessory set, which contains the mounts on the rear of the hull, the mounting strap, and also the rigidity straps that you see here. These straps have been painted flat black as they would be on the real unit as is the little carry handle like a briefcase and the wood block itself was then dyed and weathered with the same techniques that I touched upon with the staves. Once it is complete it really leaves for a very nice realistic result that you can see here. From the jack block brings us to the tools themselves. These were the six scale icons tools that I referenced earlier and you can see what they look like now, fully painted and weathered. For the weathering, this is again airbrushing with a little bit of dry brushing, much along the lines as I weather my 1-6 scale weapons and other model weapons, but you can see what they look like when applied to a tool application. Again, the handles weathered in the same format. Here goes the shovel right here. It's funny, on my tools I tend to go back and forth on how I weather them. Sometimes I add the dry brushing for the scratch steel, sometimes I don't. Yeah, it really more or less depends on the look and the feel I'm going for. But, you know, this always adds a little bit of extra variety for the builder to have in his toolbox. So that's something to consider. And here we have the jack, right? Or, I'm sorry, the that's going to be coming up in the next scene. This here is the axe. The axe also, again, same type of details or weathering that has been applied. So, these are going to be affixed to the model. Let's continue with some of the other accessories that are also ready for installation at this time. And on the topic of the jack, here we have the next batch of parts. So, starting with the jack, this is the same Armor Packs jack that has been touched upon in earlier videos. This, again, was supplied with the King Tiger kit, or this generation of King Tiger kit, as I mentioned earlier. The jack itself is simply just painted and weathered. In the format that you see here, this is a mix of just spray, uh, flat black spray paint for the base coat. There's a little bit of airbrushing for a diluted rust look like you can hopefully see in this image here. And then just some dry brushing was done to just wear down some of the high points that are found on this component. Not too much weathering was done. It's, you know, just a nice little lightly used component. The next is the pry bar. This was kit supplied with the Armor Tech kit, as I touched upon in another video. And again, just some standard dry brushing and weathering techniques was utilized on this piece as well. The next are the cast bronze or brass claws that I also touched upon in another video. These were supplied on this generation of Armor Tech King Tiger. And uh, one thing I do want to mention is that on the later generations of Armor Tech King Tiger, the, this is no longer the case and they now have their own CNC version of the claw, which in my opinion are not nearly as good as these ones here. And these ones here were awesome. If anyone has the opportunity to track one of these down, I strongly recommend it because they are definitely worth the money and will just enhance the build thoroughly. But with that out of the way, these again, just, you know, weathered in the, much along the same lines as the other components. These are just going to slide onto the ECA claw mounts that I touched upon in an earlier video. And also mounting onto some of the mounts that was discussed earlier, here we have the starter crank. Nothing much going on here. This is the kit supply one. The only thing that I added was for the handle on a few of these, there's this little pipe that's on here. And I guess it, you know, aids with the hand crank during operation. And for the handle itself, I actually used a piece of heat shrink tubing and it wasn't even painted. The way you see it is basically the natural color of the shrink tubing, but I did go ahead and add some airbrush weathering on this section over here. Obviously, this is where people are going to grab it and it's going to wear a little bit differently compared to the remainder of the piece itself. So, time to go ahead and get these installed. Let's go ahead and go with the next barrage of parts that are getting fitted to the model at this time. 
the next largest and definitely the most unwieldy bit of equipment that's going to be affixed to the model at this time are the tow cables. The cables include both the main tow cables themselves as well as the track removal cable, which is the smaller, thinner one here. And of course, I've mentioned this in an earlier video, but as a quick recap, these are the ones that are supplied with the kit and are simply utilized as is. The only thing I needed to do was to paint and weather them to the configuration that you see here. For the track removal cables, you'll see that there is this extra little bit of equipment found on the two end sections. These are 3D printed and these are to hook up to the ECA 3D printed tow cable mounts that are already fixed to the vehicle. And again, I've referenced this bit of information in an earlier video. But here's what the pieces finally look like in their final form. And are just going to be mounted to the model. And once added, they're definitely going to enhance the look of the build overall. Progressing further takes us to some more of the fittings that are ready for installation at this time, which would include the antenna base, the wire cutter, the rear reflector, and also the Tetra fire extinguisher. All of these items were mentioned in, of course, previous videos, but here you get to see the antenna now fully assembled. The antenna base is made out of cast rubber, and this is a item that is not on the ECA catalog. It's my own rubber casting, but it's not something I ever list on the catalog for one reason or another. If anyone, by the way, is interested in picking up a set of these, you know, just hit me up on the email address, info at eastcoastarmory.com, and, you know, we'll see if we can work something out. But basically, we have a cast rubber antenna base, and then we have the stem, which is actually brass, and I have the little wing nut detailing that we have here, which would be found on German AFV World War II pattern antenna bases. The piece is all brass, or as you can see, it's been painted to look like brass. The wire itself is just nothing more than 16 of an inch floor wire. And at the moment, it is not permanently glued on in place. This is something that I always advocate on these 1-6 scale models because it just makes maneuvering and storing the model that much easier without having this thing whipping around and potentially causing problems. The piece just slides directly into its location like you see right here. And in order to prevent it from sliding all the way through, the bottom portion here is crimped. So it has a nice stopping point so that you cannot over insert the component. The wire cutter is the 6 scale icons one that I, again, mentioned earlier. And now you get to see it painted. One thing to point out is that on the German World War II pattern of wire cutters, the handles are not wood. They are actually steel, but they're wrapped with a thin veneer. And on the end sections, there are these two knobs that are made from red Bakelite. And on the model here, I painted it to replicate that or as, as much as I possibly can with the type of paints that I work with. It's nothing more than just acrylic painted over. And then the metal sections, of course, are weathered accordingly. The reflector is the HD 3D printed one from the ECA set. And here you get to see what it looks like fully painted and ready for installation. In order to give it a little bit more sheen, the lens section was brushed over with a swipe of Tamiya Gloss Clear. And this gives it that nice realistic appearance that you can see right here. This will just drop directly into place when the time comes. And the next thing is the Tetra Fire Extinguisher. This, again, is a Armor Packs cast resin component. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Armor Tech kit came with this component as stock. And here's what it looks like fully painted and weathered. Again, the Armor Packs Tetra can be purchased on his website, which is armorpacks.com. And they are the best option on the market for a Tetra Fire Extinguisher in 1.6 scale. They truly are awesome, and I always recommend them and use them on the various 1.6 scale German builds that you see posted on this channel. And the very last detail that's going to be mounted to the model at this time is the Bow MG34T barrel. As I may have touched upon in an earlier video, the stock kit does supply you with this bit of detailing. However, it's rather basic in its overall appearance, as what is generally found on many of the kit supplied parts. For the one on this model here, this is actually a vintage cast resting component from Panzerwerk. The Panzerwerk component was always a gorgeously detailed piece. However, sadly, Panzerwerk is no longer in operation. And basically, just like with the tools, we have another Highlander situation over here. So fortunately for this build, I had I was able to obtain one. And this is the unit that is currently painted, weathered, and is about to be fitted in place. Just like with all German World War II tanks of the period, the Bow MG is also the same is true for the Coax, and that is the use of an MG34T. For one reason or another, the 42 was never utilized for this role, and even up until the very end, the 34T was utilized. The 34T from Panzerwerk is a gorgeous piece with all the appropriate detailing present, is a single cast resin component, and it's one that once added to the model, it never disappoints. For the weathering, I went ahead and used my typical format with the use of flat black for the base coat, dry brushing for the worn look that we have here, and then some airbrush 
I airbrush some areas of soot on the areas which would be appropriate. For an MG34, this here is the booster, so obviously this here on the muzzle end would get quite a bit of fouling. And also with the way it works, when the barrel reciprocates with the short recoil of this action, these ports over here are opened up and it's not uncommon for a little bit of blast to emerge from those sections, leaving you for the power fouling that you see present on this example. That's really all there is to mention about weathering an MG34, so from here this baby is going to be mounted into the vehicle. Well, after seeing all those components on the table, now you can see what they look like installed to the model. So, here we have the shovel, the sledgehammer, and on the opposite side here you can see the axe. Also carrying on further, you get to see the hooks that was also mentioned earlier. Moving rearward, we have here the main tow cables the starter cable, as well as the cleaning staves all mounted as well. The pry bar, grenade grill covers, the wire cutter, and also on the very reverse side we have here the fire extinguisher and the antenna base. Moving to the rear we have those large claws jack block and the jack itself. On the reverse side we have the remaining of the components, namely the other side tow cables, the staves, and most importantly the track removal cable all fished into its appropriate area. Well as you can see this project is basically done now. There are only one or two small things that are left to be remaining. One would be the addition of spare tracks to the turret racks. The tracks are fully assembled. They're currently drying right now with their base coat, but the weather that I have right here is not exactly very cooperative. But rest assured, they are going to be weathered and secured and will be present in the next final end of project video update. The other thing that still needs to be added is a little bit of powder fouling on the exhaust manifolds as well as on the barrel and the coax MG. Right now, the Rust effects are still growing on the exhaust manifolds, again, thanks to the weather slowing everything down a bit, but they should be installed probably tomorrow if everything goes accordingly. But outside of that, this one, uh, it's basically all done, and I'm really saying this with a huge smile on my face. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for the 1.6 scale radio-controlled Armortech German King Tiger heavy tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being 1.6 scale project update videos like this one over here or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted all the way since the project start as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been mentioned on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.